Well, it is good to see you here this morning, and it's good to be back after a few months. And we plan on studying a passage from the Bible this morning, so you may want to be turning with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll be there in just a few minutes. Uh, all of us should already have the bread and the fruit of the vine with us that we either brought with us or picked up on the way in, on the table, in the entryway. Uh, so after our lesson from the Bible, Aaron will lead us in prayers for the bread and the fruit of the vine, and then we'll sing one song together. And immediately after that song, we will leave and we will get outside right away. Uh, as we've done for the past two months now, I want to start by reviewing God's plan of salvation for the benefit of all of us here and also for anybody who may watch later online. Uh, God sent his son to this earth to live a perfect life, which he did. He accomplished that mission and then he died in our place. He was buried and he was raised up on the third day. And we respond to that good news. We obey the gospel by believing the message by turning away from sin, by confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and then by allowing ourselves to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. As most of you know, over the past few months, we've been sharing pictures of baptisms around the world, trying to keep us all tied in to the larger Christian community. And uh, so we've been doing this lately. The one in the middle is a picture of Kaimana. And Kaimana was baptized just about a week ago at the congregation in Honolulu, Hawaii. And so that's the, the picture, one on top of each other in the middle. And so um, what I appreciate about the picture from Hawaii is how the kids are gathered around the baptistry. Uh, that was a neat thing to see there. And so we, uh, we, we rejoice with him. Uh, on the top right, there's a picture of Michelle, and she's being baptized in Dallas, Texas, just a few days ago. And then on the bottom right, there is a picture of Marty. Uh, he's the preacher. He's a friend of mine in Colorado, uh, just outside of Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, Marty is baptizing Sarah in those pictures. So we rejoice with Kaimana and Mashela and Sarah this week. And we put these up here as an example. What they have done, we can also do. And uh, so they have obeyed the gospel just over the past several days. If you're here, we can do this downstairs. If you're not here joining us online, uh, you can come here, we'll meet you, or we'll go meet you somewhere in this community. But if you want to study, uh, get in touch, and we'd be glad to do that. Several weeks ago, my wife and I made a trip out to Ridgeway, Wisconsin. Some of you have maybe been to Ridgeway, and we went there to get some takeout at High Point Steakhouse. Uh, it is a good place to eat. It's always been good, but we've continued to go there the last couple months because they've been providing free lunches for anybody in need. So no cost. They just uh, show up. If you're hungry, they will feed you at lunchtime. And so we've been going down there to support them here and there on date night whenever we can. And on our way back from Ridgeway a few weeks ago, something caught my eye. And I think I'd seen this before, but I'd forgotten about it over the last year or so. But what I saw served as a reminder. And so last Sunday afternoon, I got on my bike and took the Military Ridge State Trail down to the intersection uh, of the Mili Military Ridge Trail and Highway PD. So that's about eight miles west of where we live in Madison. And I went there to take this picture. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the tradition of placing a ghost bike anywhere where somebody is killed by a car when a cyclist is killed by a car they take an old bike they'll paint it all white and then they'll leave it at the site of the accident as a reminder for the rest of us and here in madison we've seen these a few places around town i don't know if you guys have seen the ghost bikes here and there uh, i think there's one at the corner of first street in east wash i've seen one there i've seen one uh, at mineral point in yellowstone on the west side of madison i think there's one off the bike trail just off of willie street on the isthmus and maybe you've seen some of these as well and every time it's a shocking reminder that uh, you know be careful that kind of thing and so it's a reminder of, of for us as drivers the one on highway pd has a name valerie flogel and she was killed when she crossed this intersection on her bike and struck an SUV at uh, 3.40 in the afternoon of July 21st, 2019. So just over a year ago, or just less than a year ago. And whenever we see one of these bikes, we slow down and we pay attention and we think about it. And we remember that something happened there and uh, it has a way of changing our behavior. So this morning, as we come back together for the first time in several months, I want to invite you again to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's study another memorial this morning, and I'm referring to the Lord's Supper. We don't have time to look at this passage in depth, but I at least want us to take a few moments to learn something from Paul's inspired words here. 
in context in this chapter, right before this, Paul is correcting an abuse of the Lord's Supper. Apparently, the wealthy were coming in and they were gorging themselves on the Lord's Supper. They were eating and drinking all they wanted. Uh, but those who were poor were left out. And so they went away without being able to partake of the Lord's Supper. And that obviously makes Paul very angry. And so he deals with that and he corrects that behavior. And then he brings us all the way back to the beginning. He brings us back to Jesus. And that's where we pick up with this in mind in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we look over what Paul's written here, let's think about what we actually do when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And right away we notice that the Memorial Supper is intended to help us remember. This is the purpose of a memorial, to help us remember something that's happened. In the words of Jesus, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then also, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How strange it is to do something in memory of something that we never saw in the first place. Isn't that a strange thing? We weren't there. And so we're remembering something that we never witnessed. And yet this is what the Lord's Supper is. We weren't there, but by reading the eyewitness accounts, we remember the Lord's body. And we remember how he came to this earth in the flesh. He was born into a poor family. We remember his sin, sinless life. We remember the words that he spoke, the miracles he performed. We remember his betrayal. We remember his unlawful arrest. We remember the injustice of a trial held under the cover of darkness in the middle of the night. We remember the false accusations that were made against him as they scrambled to find witnesses to condemn the Lord. They couldn't even agree and get their own story straight between them all. We remember the abuse that he endured for us, the beatings, the crown of thorns, being blindfolded, spit on, slapped in the face. And then we remember the nails in his hands and his feet, the spear in his side, the violent death, the most unjust death in the history of this world. And according to Paul, notice Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. In other words, he did all of this and he suffered for us. This is personal. This is why we need to remember. In his body, he took on the punishment we deserved. His blood was poured out for us and the son of God took our place. He suffered and he died instead of us. And so in a sense, then when we partake of the supper, we put ourselves at the foot of the cross and we remember it as if we were actually there, even though we were not. It is a permanent memorial. It will never crumble. It will never fall apart or deteriorate as many of the memorials that we see around us will. It will never be toppled or defaced by a mob, but it is a simple meal originating in the mind of God and personally explained by the Lord himself on the night before he was crucified for us. And so the Lord's Supper then is a memorial. And again, even though we weren't actually there, by partaking of the memorial, we remember the most significant event in all of world history, the death of Jesus on the cross for us. And so very simply, when we eat the bread, when we drink the cup, we think of Jesus. He is our focus. He is the reason for us being here this morning and we just remember what he did for us. As we go back to 1 Corinthians 11, there is something else the Lord's Supper causes us to do, and that is it causes us to give thanks. In verse 24, Paul refers to Jesus having given thanks. And that word, translated here basically as thanksgiving or the giving of thanks, is the basis of the English word Eucharist. Most of us have probably heard the word Eucharist, haven't we? Used in a religious sense. Uh, that is basically a transliteration of a Greek word. So they brought a Greek word and just turned it into an English word. But that word Eucharist means the giving of thanks. 
I've read that by the time of the second century, this is the most common word that people would use to refer to the Lord's Supper. They didn't primarily refer to it as the Lord's Supper or the memorial or anything like that, but they simply referred to it as the thanksgiving. This is the giving of thanks. We thank God when we partake of this meal. And so on one hand, the Lord's Supper is a somber memorial. We remember what he did for us. But at the same time, his death also gives us a reason to be thankful. And so in that sense, it is a cheerful meal. And so at the same time, it is both somber and cheerful because we have something to be thankful for. In verse 25, notice Paul quotes Jesus as referring to the new covenant in my blood. In Matthew, the Lord says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord Jesus poured out his blood for us so that our sins could be forgiven for the forgiveness of sins. That same phrase, by the way, for the forgiveness of sins is found in Acts 2.38. As Peter answers the question, brethren, what shall we do? And he says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So just as Jesus poured out his blood for the forgiveness of sins, so also in the same way in the act of baptism, we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And so the point here is the memorial causes us to be thankful for this. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember what he went through, and then we thank God for the forgiveness of our sins. As we think back during the Lord's Supper to the death, burial, and resurrection, perhaps we can think back to our own death, burial, and resurrection. And I think all of us in this room have died, and we've been buried, and we've been resurrected, haven't we? At the time of our own baptism, we went through the death, burial, and resurrection in a sense. And so as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, certainly there is a, a value to giving thanks for the forgiveness of our own sins. And this leads us to something else the Lord's Supper causes us to do. When we partake of the memorial, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so there's something deeply personal about the Lord's Supper, about the memorial. But there is also a public aspect of the supper. We announce or we proclaim the Lord's death. We make it known. By partaking, we're making a statement. When we come together, we're saying to each other, we're saying to the world, the death of Jesus is important to us. His death matters. And because it matters, um, it, it, well, it's something that we proclaim. And we'll proclaim it until he comes. This is a memorial that will continue until the end of time itself. And by saying that we proclaim it until he comes, we're affirming that he's alive. And we're also affirming that he's coming back. And in a nutshell, that's the gospel message, his death, burial, resurrection, and his return at some point in the future. That's the good news. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, we're proclaiming this. We're making this public. We're doing this openly. Uh, we're saying it to each other. We're also saying it to the world. Anybody who may pass by, this is a public event that we do. So every week... Um, I've heard it described every Lord's Day, we add another link in the chain, tying together the Lord's crucifixion with his final return. And that was a neat thing. I think that makes sense to me. Every week we're a little bit closer, and the supper is what connects the Lord's first coming with his second. So this morning we've studied the Lord's Supper very briefly, and we've looked at what is chronologically speaking the first written record of the Lord's instruction on this. If I understand it correctly, 1 Corinthians was most likely written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in time sequence. And so this is one of the first written records of the supper that we actually have. And in the study this morning, we've learned that when we partake of the supper, we remember, we give thanks, and we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And it is so good to be back together, even with a small group like this, to partake of the Lord's Supper uh, together this morning. In just a moment, we'll go to God in prayer. And then Aaron will lead us in the prayers for the Lord's Supper, for the bread, and then also for the juice. And then we'll close with a song before we head out. But uh, as we wrap up this part of the service, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us to be together this morning. We're thankful for good health and for a safe place to meet. Above all, we are thankful for Jesus and for his death for us on the cross. Thank you for making a way for us to be forgiven. Thank you for making a way for us to come back to you. This morning, we pray for our nation and for the difficult times we're facing right now. 
As your people, we pray for wisdom and courage to know and to say and to always do what's right. As we continue in worship, we pray that everything that we do today is, in, is acceptable in your sight. We come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, our Passover. Lord, come quickly. Amen. Good morning. So this, this is the time we're going to do communion. Um, I'm going to pray for the bread and the juice together at the same time. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity for us to come together once again um, as a group to partake of the Lord's Supper, the juice and the bread as this memorial of the sacrifices that you gave to us or did for us so that we can be with you in heaven your son perfect sacrifice gave up himself freely so that we can be forgiven thank you for everything you do for us in jesus name we pray amen All right, let's sing a song before we head out. <clears throat> the great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue. Sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus blessed Jesus. Oh, glory to the dying when I now believe in Jesus. I love the blessed Savior, saint. I love the name of Jesus. Sweetest name in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. His name dispels my guilt and fear, no other name but Jesus. Oh, how my soul delights to hear the charming name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph's song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. And when to that bright world above we rise to see our Jesus, we'll sing around the throne of love, his name, the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph's song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Garbage can by the back of the 